It's my very great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, George Lopez, as many of you know, uh, had a very distinguished career at the University of Notre Dame uh, in the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. I think George has spent about 25 years there and, uh, you know, that's a significant contribution. George worked in a number of areas, more recently uh, on the utility or non-utility of sanctions, an important area in conflict management uh, and keeping the peace, hopefully, and preventing uh, worse things uh, from happening. And uh, in the fall, uh, he moved to uh, D.C. Sooner or later, everybody comes to D.C. for a brief or for a longer period, so we very much welcome uh, George to D.C. and to the United States Institute of Peace, where he's taken on a senior position as Vice President of the Academy for International Conflict Management and Peace Building. And so, uh, along with many other good folks at USIP, we continue to look to that institution as a leader in the field in many ways. And I know George will take the Academy forward uh, in productive and useful directions. So George, please, uh, he's going to address us on conflict resolution at the crossroads, where else to be? Thanks very much, Ron, and uh, I'm really just tickled to be here because it's not only a great invitation from your steering committee to address this topic, but uh, I'm about 67 hugs behind in terms of seeing a bunch of old friends and, and, and good people as well as meeting some new friends. So I'm delighted to be here, but also a little bit daunted by the task. I think we mutually chose the title for a couple of reasons. One was because I think at many, many programs we're struggling as to, as to where we are. Um, I had the good advantage of looking back at a little bit of history and uh, realized in, um, in the summer of 1989, wonderful Chad Alger, who left us a couple of months ago, um, wrote an essay in a, in a piece, in a, in a journal I edited, The Annals. Uh, the, the wider journal was called Peace Studies, Past and Future, and uh, his piece was called um, Peace studies at the crossroads, question mark, where else, exclamation point. And I think it may be very much the case that given our multiple struggles about where our field is going, the pressures it operates on, are we meeting the needs of the field or, or, or of the students who come to us, maybe we are at a kind of crossroads. So I'd like to use that kind of theme to organize a bit of what I share with you this afternoon. Um, and and I, I, I make the, the worst of apologies in that I'm, I'm going to kind of hit and run um, uh, because I part of my new wonderful responsibilities is that uh, I drew the last straw on teaching uh, or the short straw on teaching a, a course to UAE diplomats uh, at that uh, other institution in town called CSIS, uh, which some of you know is on the security often rather than on the peace side. Um, but it's a good opportunity for us to do conflict resolution and negotiation skills with a good group of young people. So I need to be there at one, so I'll run shortly after my remarks. Um, but all questions can be directed to Jeff Helsing, uh, who's here over here. <laughs> I gather from at least the great discussion I was part of and learning something about what many of you shared with each other yesterday that um, how we organize our programs in terms of the knowledge available to us both the heritage of our field and peace and conflict studies and conflict resolution, as well as all the plethora of new approaches, findings, methodologies that come from the more traditional disciplines, that's obviously one of the challenges of our time and one of our challenges in, in what we teach and, and how we organize our programs. Another challenge is, is the problem of skills, not only what skills are actually necessary for the complete peace builder in 2013, 14, 15, and going forward, but what are the skills that are marketable? Marketable to the mid-career people who come to, our, come to our programs, and certainly marketable to the younger and younger generation, which seems to be appearing, as, as well as that which is important in the robust undergraduate programs we have. That 
challenge of knowledge and skills, I think, reflects also the pressure of the explosion of knowledge. Uh, the explosion of knowledge which comes from our recognition, many in this room and some of our colleagues not here, of course, of the terrible reality of violence that's changed since many of us came to the field years and years ago. The contours of violence demand the creating of a peace on the ground that's very, very different than the Cold War framework or the standard negotiation mediation framework that many of us were trained in ourselves. To some extent, maybe this is a kind of identity crisis or a crossroads. To worry about that knowledge dimension, the experiential dimension, how it combines, whether to teach more academics, whether to teach more skills, that's why I chose the title, Where Else to Be. I've always thought, influenced in part by my founding experience in my early career at Earlham College and working with the wonderful Quakers who guided that program I was able to be a part of, that what distinguished peace and conflict studies within an academy, that is within the academic venture, is that we have the ability to do thinking and action. In the words of my colleague Tony Bing, it was how do we think our way into new forms of action and act our way into new dimensions of thinking. And that reinforcing system dynamic, thinking our way into new action and acting our way into new thinking, means that the crosswords not only is exactly where we want to be, but that sage philosopher of the American psyche, Yogi Berra, was right. When you come to the fork in the road, take it. <laughs> so I think we should take the thought and the action and blend them together. And that's what I want to partly do with us this morning. And at the same time recognize that taking that particular fork has to recognize that we're in a different place where many of us went through our own graduate education, even if the graduation is as recent as four or five years ago. To dig deeper into our past, the relationship between the peace research, the conflict studies action, the conflict and resolution problematique in which many of us were socialized had to do not only with a wider world of organized warfare, as opposed to the anarchic killing fields that lurk among us in these many places, but it also had a dynamic of a set of findings about how you get parties to the table, what's the results of mediation and negotiation, and how wars end. Some of that's up for grabs, both in its relevance uh, to what we would teach and also to its adequacy to the CARs, the South Sudans, and the Syrias that we're currently experiencing. At the same time, I think we have to recognize that there's been an explosion of vibrant research questions, great findings, new methodologies that come to us from the traditional disciplines. Whether it's beginning with anthropology or going all the way through zoology, there are an awful lot of traditional academic disciplines that now legitimate the analysis of conflict, violence, outcomes of that. 25 years ago, who would have thought that psychologists in our program would come in and not be worrying about mirror images of Soviet and American negotiators, but be concerned about trauma and its impact on entire communities as they tried to recover from violence? Who would have thought we would have psychologists who study the patterns of child socialization in encampments, in refugee camps, and what that means in their attitudes towards violence or their resiliency? Who would have thought we're focused on the emergence and recruitment of violent extremists with a huge analysis of what it means to become a youth in a violent society? Which obviously begs then all sorts of interesting dynamics in gender analysis, concept of manhood, concept of the role of women in society and the like. I think someone like our founding grandmother of the field, Elise Bolding, would have said to us this disciplinary dynamic is rich and has to be integrated into the continual growth of knowledge in our more transdisciplinary field of peace and conflict studies 
because it helps us focus better on the human condition and how we bring the human condition to greater attention to the prospects for peace and particularly a just and sustainable peace. So now and in the future, what should inform this collision and merging of disciplines and transdisciplinary knowledge dynamics? What are the factors in the real world that might help push us in the process of knowledge that's useful in the classroom and for the logic and creation of programs? I'd like to share with you then one my understanding of that knowledge as it meets the real world and what the relevant, at least from Lopez for the moment, what the relevant big areas to capture might be in our programs and how they affect the prospect for a successful peace building program and then talk a, a good bit about perspectives and techniques. What is it we should be teaching and equipping the future peace builders with? And even as I posit this knowing a number of our own experiences in this room, I'm not going to be surprised that 10 to 15 years from now this is dramatically out of date. Hopefully because the violence curve has reduced and the peace building and peace with justice curve is dramatically on the incline. It puts us a little bit in that, if you excuse the phrase, Donald Rumsfeld world that we know some things about what we don't know but we don't know what we don't know in the unknown. So. With that as the caveat, let me go forward. The first and most important substantive and experience challenge to what we do in the peace building field, it seems to me, particularly at the graduate level, is how do we process and grope with what globalization has wrought? I have a few dimensions to posit of that. The first and most significant, and for those of you who are cutting your teeth in the, in the 1970s on things like the World Order Models Project and the like, you're going to say, now he says it. Now he's going to say it. What's characteristic of what globalization has wrought for us is the abject failure of the state system to support human security in so many corners of the globe. That abject failure of the state system to do so has been undermined by, un, uh, un, uh, has been reinforced by a number of trends, economic, informational, the patterns of violence itself, the mythology that there would be 192 viable entities called nation states when in reality there's only about 28, and any number of dimensions of how to understand the conflicts that run within and across them. That dynamic I worry a lot about in its own real world context, but I think it's especially challenging to us at the collegiate and university level because so much of what we do is interlinked with the standard international affairs curriculum or many new programs have developed over the last 20 years as core components of big graduate schools of international affairs. ICAR, CROC, and some other places, San Diego and, and, and Notre Dame CROC, we're, we're a little bit unique in that we're not necessarily tied to that. But many programs in this town and in this area are very much placed within international affairs graduate programs. And in some respects, back in the 80s and 90s, we were trying to claw our way into that. It seemed like a victory. I think it's a real tension now because the fundamental aspect of a global affairs MA is to provide you with the tools so you can be successful as someone working within the state system. If in peace and conflict studies we think the state system is bankrupt, not as a value judgment but as an empirical reality, we're, we're sort of crashing heads. And we all have avoided that discussion, either in a good intellectual way or, you know, in the halls over, over lunch and coffee. But it's one that I think is, is on the cusp of happening because it has to. Another thing that I believe that globalization has wrought is that crime and corruption may now be the great enemies of peace. It's not ideology, despite the fact that ideology leads to hatred. It's not ethnic difference, despite the fact that ethnic dynamics and hate can fuel cycles of conflict in certain locales. But whether it's, as one of my 
colleagues in our discussion group from Philadelphia spoke so eloquently about it, whether it's on a corner or in a street in northern Philadelphia, or whether it's in lower Los Angeles, or whether it's in the connection between Honduras and Salvador through Mexico to Los Angeles in terms of gangs, trafficking in drugs, arms, persons, and laundered money, this is the great enemy that underscores and supports. Supports the violence, underscores the attack on human security and the human condition, and eludes the power of governmental authorities to crush it. That dynamic means that one of the small growth industries I've seen in the field over the last decade is a lot of criminal justice programs looking for conflict resolution courses, groping with very important issues of restorative justice. How do we in our community continue to throw teenagers in jail for drug possession? And as Elizabeth Warren has been talking about on the circuit, folks like uh, from the bank that made its deal with the government for $36 billion yesterday uh, for tax evasion. Nobody goes to jail. How's that possible with all the racial and other dimensions that are to that in our country and elsewhere? Thirdly, the dimension that may run all the way across the founding of peace studies in Europe to now is we've always been concerned about arms races and militarism. It was formed in the height of the Cold War. But I bet we could look across our program right now and say there's very few courses that have anything to do with arms. But you know what? The empirical reality is that we're a world of wash in arms. And I think peace and conflict studies avoid this at their peril. How is it possible in two areas as incredibly poor and devastated as Honduras and South Sudan citizens, there are more guns than citizens. How does Honduras have the highest murder rate in the world? Our own urban streets in America, conflict zones of major proportion. Chicago being one of the more glaring examples of trying to struggle with this over the last couple of years. In a world awash of arms, we can't talk seriously about peace building unless we address that. I believe that the connection between crime, corruption, the failure of the state, the flow and availability of arms, and the ethics and practice that sustain killing as a way of solving disputes, that's our problematique. And how and where do we grope with that in new ways? Yes, 20 years after Rwanda, we still have to worry about genocide and create and pay attention to its early warning systems. But one of the dynamics we find is that this collection of things I've mentioned has put the violence problem at a new depth that none of us anticipated. I, you know, may, maybe a number of us in this room saw the photos released about homes over the last couple of weeks now that uh, the Assad forces have retaken the city. What city? All I saw was block after block of incredible rubble. We used to have as one of the guiding questions of praxis in our field, how do you get all the parties to the table? We didn't have, how do you reconstruct a society and a city and city after city and a people after devastating violence? I think there was some debate yesterday I heard about, are we overemphasizing peace building? I don't think we have any choice but to examine peace building because we're looking at societal collapse or societal malformation skewed by violence and gangs. And in that dynamic, whether it's in Congo, South Sudan, Syria, or Honduras, our challenge is much more societally deep and structurally deep than we ever envisioned a number of years ago. Other big trends that reinforce this obviously climate change. And I don't say that in terms of being sort of politically acceptable in the moment. I find very convincing 
from long ago, the studies of Thomas Homer Dixon and the Toronto group about the pre-climatic change, movement of people, agricultural change that occurred before the hate speech occurred on the radio that led to the killings in Rwanda. Wonderful study in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists a couple of years ago about the same process occurring, which led to great pressure in northern cities in Syria, which led to the protests which now get us to where we are. It's not a direct causal arrow, but the systemic nature of that is critical and important to us. I'm partway through the new David Kilcullen book on this dynamic of the power of urbanization, population shifts, the movement to coasts and cities, and for those of us who maybe cut some of our teeth in, in our social science education on people like Charles Tilley and, and uh, on the anthropology side, Bill Mengen, how peasants come to cities, Kilcullen has modernized this in a whole different way. We used to think about, well, was the city alienating and drove people to revolt and violence? Did the city, through its churches and ethnic connections, provide an organizing framework? What happens in cities now, Kilcullen shows, is people are greeted by armed gangs that run the neighborhoods in which the emigres come. And you're either for us or against us. Well, we know where that goes in terms of the role of violence in people's lives, whether it's in Rio or Los Angeles or in Washington, D.C. What kind of curricular response can we make to these big changes? What's the appropriate thing for us to do? Well, let me be very prescriptive as a way to stimulate some conversation and still try to stay within in my time limits. The first and most important thing, I think, is for us to say, whatever our training, whatever the good disciplines we relate to the field of peace and conflict studies, we've left the realm of the single case study, as important as that is. We've left the realm of even the comparative cases. Thank you, Alexander George. We've left the realm of the causal arrows and the regression equation of the behavioral dimension. And at its best, what we probably need to be is the world of engineers or the world of Robert Sigliano, which is that we're systems thinking. We have to think about this as a dynamically related system that challenges us in this peace puzzle. What drives, sustains, reinforces violence is complex systems. And if we're to do successful peace building, as somebody like Grisigliano argues in Making Peace Last, is to develop a systematic approach. So the first challenge to our graduate, if not undergraduate education, is how do we begin to think systemically? Now you might say, so what do we do with one of our basic skills, conflict analysis? Well then I think you turn to Lisa Shirk and see in her new book, she looks at conflict analysis and peace building planning. That systematic planning is partly what flows from the succinct and clear but comprehensive conflict analysis. I think it's important for us to think as we think about that shift that we're staying within a certain kind of tradition of our field that it's best. Whether in the 70s or 80s you used Haley or other books on perspectives on peace, one of the things we said to ourselves is we knew that peace was an essentially contested concept. So if you're worried about whether or not peace building is what we should focus on, because it might be particularly by governments used too much as a cover for state building and reinforcing a certain programmatic democratic peace, then that's exactly what we want to engage because we're supposed to be more critically self-reflective of what we do than most of the other areas and disciplines. Peace building is an essentially contested concept, and we ought to treat it that way in our program, but highlight the unique situation in which we are that the massively destructive violence may demand no less, and that just peace would seem to many a wild aspiration. All they'd like is a little bit of security and less arbitrary killing, thank you, but because we know this end of arbitrary killing is the need of today, it doesn't make sense to work only for that if we don't have that view of the just peace of tomorrow and that those two are dramatically linked. I think there's still a great role 
for empirical research. One of the best examples of that we have is looking at the groundbreaking and delighted to say award-winning work of Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan on why does nonviolence work. How many of us grew up on Gene Sharp and King and others in which we were philosophically, ethically, or on a case-by-case -case basis convinced of the utility, the normative power, the reality of nonviolence. And it takes people in a security studies program three decades after most of us learned that to show the real data, along with some other good books that came along and did the same. That dynamic is important. The data is going to speak to a large audience in government and in our universities so that still has a place. But the plethora of great studies in anthropology, psychology, communications theory, and other fields are things that we have to get within our purview. How are we going to deal with crime and corruption unless we have a serious confrontation with economics, sociology, and criminal justice? Now, does that mean that all of our programs now have to have all of these fields associated with them? No, but it does mean that as we think about structuring our grad education, even at the very practitioner level, we look for new allies because those discipline-based queries that people are raising, whether it's prison reform, the gender dynamic of violence, the healing of children from violence, trauma and its treatment, or our nursing school, which looks at, in our community, gun violence being the number one public health problem, these are our new allies. And I think the integration of them into our program is going to be significant. In the same way that there's no English department or chemistry department or history department in our colleges and universities that covers all the subfields, our program should not carry the burden of having to be schematically accurate linking all disciplines under all conditions into what we do. We'll take what the faculty and the interests give us and integrate it into the skill set and the knowledge base we're trying to get with our students. I think that integration then says something as we make the transition here to the skill level. I'm probably giving away my 30 plus years in academia by saying I still think there's a place for the solid research paper as not only the quality of what comes out of a master's program, but there are areas of the world in which our students will work where only the 20 to 25 page heavily footnoted, heavily documented, well-written research paper is going to be convincing. But that doesn't mean it defines our program. The complete peace building program, in my mind, gives students the opportunity, particularly if it's what links us to that disciplinary faculty member who does that kind of work, gives them the opportunity to produce that kind of output into their traveling portfolio for their first job, but also to have a set of other very important products that we do within our more specialized courses. The 4,000 word grant proposal. I think it's very important for students to write grant proposals because that's what a lot of they're going to be asked to do. Now, they may have never written a successful grant proposal, but to have the mock grant proposal has been critiqued by their peers, by you, by others, very, very important. The 2,000 word policy brief, the two page concept note, and the concise statement that they can read in front of a TV monitor which is the 30-second soundbite for how are you talking about what your organization is doing here in Syria, Lebanon, or wherever. I think that range of skills, from the big, big research paper that locked you in the library for a gazillion hours, all the way to, oh my goodness, they're coming in five minutes with a microphone and a TV camera, what do I say? That collection of skills is the skills for the modern peace builder. I think it's also the case that we have to realize the drivers of violence not only put our students in jeopardy, but I suspect a number of us in this room had experiences, etc., that were bad times or 
seeing what's happening in certain sections of the world, like Ukraine, says, why do I feel like I've been here before? Or any number of things like that. But I don't think it's nearly what our students bring to us today in terms of the direct experience with violence for some of them, if they've been in Peace Corps or had other experiences, or what we're asking them to go out to. I think it's important for our students to understand trauma as a survival skill. Much more importantly, it's important for us to grow from the literature, the praxis in which we know that reflective practice is one of the key behavioral survival professional skills of the folks who are going to try to make a life of this as their profession. I think it's very, very important for us to understand and it came up in, in our discussion at our table, not by me, because I was going to highlight it. I think we're actually preparing three clusters of people in our programs. The first is the professional peace builder, the folks who want it all. Give it to me. The research paper, the concept note, everything. I want to fill up my toolkit, and out to the world I go. I think I'll start with being a vice president of Global Witness or something like that. And then they go on idealist.com and find out that, gee, funny thing, they want not only my degree, but they also want experience that I don't have yet. <laughs> so what do I do now? And they begin the internship and travel, another cycle, that get them real jobs. And we know our people can do this. But the professional peace builder gets the whole nine yards. They get the skill, they get the knowledge, they get all the courses we can offer, plus the experiences that lead them on. And that's their aspiration. A second group of people, I think, are people who seek to be peace builders, but do so within various related professions. I'm a peace builder social worker. I'm a peace builder high school teacher. I'm a peace builder juvenile corrections officer. I'm a peace builder nurse within my environment. I think the work our students do is overwhelmingly in the humanitarian sector because that's where the jobs are. And they're doing peace building through that humanitarian sector. I think we've got to find ways in which we not only further legitimate that, but bring those people back to our programs to talk about how they made the linkages to get there. Then thirdly, and this is where I'm proud to be associated with USIP. Many of you know the USIP conflict curve. I love the lower right hand part of that curve, which talks about peace building and lists the multiple functions that are required in a peace building enterprise. We need to build new legal institutions. We need to be more ed educational institutions. Health sector needs to be uh, reformed civil engineers to bring clean water, doctors to bring more medicines and medical clinics. I was at University of Massachusetts Lowell a couple of weeks ago and was introduced to a person in their late 40s who was finishing their degree there. Uh, she was a pediatric dentist and had spent the last three summer vacations in Rwanda. She said to me, for all the fanfare about all the recovery in Rwanda, you know there's only six pediatric dentists in the entire country? And she said, I think there was a thriving dentistry profession before the genocide, but this is one of the sectors that didn't come back. She saw herself as a professional peace builder a month a year going to train in that post-violence environment, a sector that hadn't come back yet. I like that bottom of the curve on the conflict dynamic from USIP because it says we need people who are gonna focus in their world of activities on understanding how and why they're a peace profession. Why and how engineers, seventh grade teachers, nurses, lawyers, and clowns, who would be part of Clowns Without Borders, of course, <laughs> all play a role. So the professional peace builder, the closely linked through another profession peace builder, and then the folks who do this in part because they're successful in their real job and transfer it, and transfer what they learn from us in a new avocational and vocational linkage way of the global local. So then what specifically should the professional peace builders and others be trained about? Well, sorry, I'm going to give you a laundry list. 
Doesn't mean that each program has to do it, but I think we're legitimate doing any of these, and the more we can do, the better off we are. First again, training in systems analysis, a la Rasigliano and Shirk. Secondly, yes, good old-fashioned negotiation and mediation, but with all the interesting asterisks, adaptations, reverberations that now come with that. Meaning, for example, there's not only track two, but there's track 1.5, there's track one, and there's the relationship between track one, 1.5, and 2.0. And the 2.5 that's probably yet to be in, invented two or three years from now. Especially on this campus, I'm happy to say, I think people have to go back to controlled communication workshops. That heritage of Burton and all the rest is very, very important. I mean, think about the backroom meetings that those things sparked and all the conflict areas where we could do that yet again. Many came to the field enamored by nonviolent direct action and resistance. Well, guess what? It's back. Except this time when people appear in nonviolent demonstrations, snipers from the government get on the roof and they assassinate them writ large. That begs a whole different kind of nonviolent resistance. And working from Chenoweth and Stefan and from the kind of things that are coming out from the Ackerman et al. program, we've got all sorts of ways to teach people how to teach other people how nonviolent resistance can survive and work. How to control hate speech how to do facilitated dialogue, how to go back to what Elise Bolding taught us on future imaging workshops. Some of that stuff can lead to a very creative program. The new and coming area, monitoring and evaluation. And boy, is this the way we can link to all sorts of colleagues in other fields and in public policy programs. We knew, knew excuse me, we need new Patterns of analysis, as you know, transnational analysis, class analysis, network analysis, gender analysis. Reflective practice is critical because it not only is an important new methodology in our field, but it's a survival skill for our students. Dealing with competing practices and theories of justice and reconciliation. Is reconciliation based in psychology, religion, or law? We could pick out societies in which each of those have worked for that society or sort of for a while. I have a couple of good South African friends who are getting beat up figuratively by their adult children looking back at the Reconciliation Commission and saying, you decided on what? After all of that with apartheid, you just said, let's kind of forgive and forget if you just come and tell us how bad you were? What kind of system is that? And look at where we are economically. And look at our level of violence. You agreed to what? Well, the reconciliation of the 1990s, which many of us believe served as a model for the future, doesn't feel very well to the generation of the 2000 teens that we're now in. So all of those things need to be re-examined. And I think there's one other dynamic. Does, does anybody have one of these? <laughs> well, it's not only about it's a cell phone. We know it's characteristic of an entire enterprise of transmission of messages, of social media, of knowledge, but we don't yet really have things like the Peace app or other things that activists and others can use. We may need this because the people who do hate speech use and work with this much more cleverly than we do. So that world of social media and the technology that lies before us is all there in the future. In short, I probably haven't given you a comprehensive and completely linked picture of where I think we are. Maybe that's partly because I can hide behind the dynamic that we're at the crossroads and where else we should be. But I think there's certain things that are central. Our research has to parallel that our violence is more local. 
Our practice has to do those local global linkages and avail ourselves of the huge range of techniques that are in our present and in our heritage to train our students up. We have to be able to make to colleagues in the universities and some cases in our state legislatures that fund our programs that there are three gradations of peace builders that are legitimate to train as the great new citizens of our locale and the globe coming forward. And we have to do so with people who have to be able to survive and thrive in their work. Which is why I want to close with a statement that was sent to me last week by one of my former students, and a former student of my colleagues that are here, uh, Ledette from Ethiopia, who was able to find a job with the Life and Peace Institute back in their Horn of Africa program, right back in her native Ethiopia. She said, to be a peace builder doesn't mean that you're not affected by the clutter of daunting reality around you. It actually means that you're human enough to be affected by it, reflective enough to understand it, and resilient enough to overcome it. The key is not to lose yourself either to complete indifference that can make you apathetic or to dismay that can drain your energy from lighting a candle into darkness. And I think no matter how depressing the state of affairs of the globe or the new dean that was hired to guide our program or any number of other things that happen as we get buffeted about in our daily work, at the end of the day, it's creating and sustaining that vision in one student at a time that our work has always been and should continue to be about. Thank you very much. Yeah.